The research shows that decentralizing external communications by empowering regular employees to serve as social brand ambassadors is a more sustainable, scalable approach. The problem is not everyone is skilled in the business of public disclosure, right? It's one thing to trust the CEO to speak on behalf of the company. It's another thing to trust employees who aren't trained in the intricacies of reputation management. So maintaining trust involves not just minimizing bad behavior, it's also about optimizing the impact of unofficial voices on official voices. It's about creating an environment where employees are encouraged and trusted to like, retweet, and comment on shares from your official branded accounts. Now, unfortunately, that's not what happened in the case of GM's ignition switch recall crisis. Their customer engagement chief was actually quoted in the press acknowledging the critical importance of talking directly to consumers via social networks during the crisis. Unfortunately, they tried to manage the crisis exclusively through their official branded social media accounts. And they failed to appreciate that after one of the worst recalls in automotive history, those voices were no longer trusted. So to rebuild the trust, they would have needed to inspire an army of goodwill ambassadors. They would have needed social proof, social evidence. But obviously, the more ambassadors you inspire, the greater the risk of social media misuse. So up to now, the strategy for managing social media misuse at most companies has been to issue a social media policy. But if you think policies protect organizations or their employees from non-compliant use, think again. No one reads social media policies. They sign form and put them in the bottom drawer. Now, this is a most recent report from a global law firm with a large labor and employment practice called Proskauer, based in New York. And uh, what they found in the most recent report, which was just released last month, um, despite the fact that 80% of employers have social media policies, 70% have disciplined employees for social media misuse. So the rise in policy does not stem the rise in misuse. And, you know, the thing is that many of these companies, their social marketing efforts on the whole have been either sidelined or marginalized as a result of misuse. So just to be clear, social media policies are necessary. You do need them, but they're insufficient for managing social media risk. Unmanaged risk is a threat to your social marketing efforts and a threat to your business. So how do you manage the risk? around encouraging employees who are not skilled in the public disclosure business? How do you encourage frontline employees who have no real training in public disclosure to serve as unofficial spokespeople? In the old days, we used to media train our CEOs. But how do you social media train your entire workforce? How do you, how do you build trust by ensuring everyone knows the basics around social media compliance? Teaching the benefits is actually the easy part. You know, this is, for those of us that are in the social media, these are things we talk about all the time, the benefits, and there's all sorts of credible third-party research we can point to. But if we're going to scale engagement by empowering unofficial voices, it's really the risk side of the equation we need to educate our employees about. And these are actual fines and penalties imposed by U.S. regulators against employers for non-compliant social media use. So I'll just point out a couple of them. Um, you can be fined by the Federal Trade Commission $11,000 per incident um, if employees tweet on behalf of their employer without disclosing their employee status in the body of the tweet. Uh, if you are scraping information off, the, email, off uh, the internet or out of emails with bots and compiling it into email marketing lists, you know, the fine can be in the millions. If you've got you know, some unit or even an agency that's working for you that's buying fake social media endorsements or testimonials, uh, you know, that can be a quarter million dollar fine. Um, so you know, the risks are quantifiable and tangible. So let's play the social media compliance game. When you hear me say social media compliance, you know, you're probably thinking 
about regulated industries. And, and frankly, when I talk about social media compliance, it's the regulated folks that seem to line up. But the truth is, it's not just for regulated companies. Certainly regulated industries have more rules to comply with, but social media compliance is actually everybody's business. So what I thought we would do is let's actually walk through the history of the major U.S. rules and regs that impact how organizations can and can't use social media lawfully in the workplace. And I'm going to use my little pointer here to point out a few of these things for you. And Eric, I did just want to point out that the majority of the audience today is in the regulated industry. So we can certainly talk about how it applies to everybody, but we can keep a focus on regulated as well. Well, whether you're regulated or whether you're unregulated, you still have to satisfy all of these issues that are on this board here. Um, so let's start with the most basic one that gets heralded by compliance officers and general counsels most frequently, and that's the National Labor Relations Act, which was passed by Congress in 1934, and how that impacts how you use social media, whether you're regulated or not, is you know your workers have a right to discuss hours, wages, and working conditions on social media, even if they do so in a manner that's disparaging. And so organizations frequently that have something in their policy that restricts employees from discussing confidential information like wages or um, uh, proprietary information without defining what that is um, are the ones that usually wind up in trouble. In 1970, way before social media was around, Congress passed the Fair Credit Reporting Act, and today it imposes restrictions on employer social media background checks, particularly with uh, job candidates. The uh, Computer Fraud and Abuse Act makes using someone else's credentials to access a social network or a Google account for that matter without proper authorization a criminal offense. The Electronic Communications Privacy Act imposes restrictions on what type of employee threads can be monitored on social media by employers. The Communications Decency Act makes sending anything, and this is a quote, obscene or indecent. It doesn't really define what that is, but sending anything obscene or indecent to a minor via electronic communications a crime. Uh, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act uh, makes hacking copyright protection software a crime, but actually indemnifies social networks from copyright infringement claims as long as they comply with takedown requests. And then most recently in... Uh, 2013, the Federal Trade Commission passed their dot-com disclosure guidelines, and that requires advertisers and marketers to disclose material relationships in the body of their social media posts. And so these are rules and regs that apply to any U.S. company that makes more than a quarter million dollars a year or has more than 11 employees. In addition to that, FINRA has released social media marketing guidelines exclusively to the financial industry. Um, HIPAA applies to uh, healthcare providers, uh, and it restricts them from sharing individually identifiable uh, patient information. If you'd like a high-res version of this, we're actually going to send it out in our newsletter, uh, which you can get at complysocially.com. It'll be in the June issue. And we created this to show you that whether you're regulated or not, social media use that is non-compliant with any of these rules and regs represents an unmanaged risk. And as you've already seen, those risks have costs. But social media risk is manageable, and it's manageable with training. So if you want to empower an army of online ambassadors, you need to show them what's expected. If you want to ensure uniform compliance with corporate policy as well as state and federal rules and regs, you must provide mandatory training, assessment, and certification. Um, as I mentioned, you know, we maintain the deepest catalog of self-paced social media compliance training courses, which can be administered to populations to ensure a baseline level of social media compliance. 
Now, particularly when it comes to teaching digital literacy skills, the research shows that e-learning outperforms classroom training. And there's really three reasons for this. Uh, you know, the first is the number one cost of training is time off the job, and e-learning's faster. Um, a six-hour class can be delivered online for as little as three hours. Um, e-learning also offers better retention rates because it's pre-recorded, so you can focus on learning instead of taking notes, and then, of course, you can you know, stop, start, rewind. Everyone learns at a different pace. And then finally, and probably I think most advantageously, you know, e-learning is more convenient. If you're going to make social media compliance training part of the onboarding process, um, on-demand training can be you know, accessed anytime, anywhere, on any device. And I think you know, being able to provide mobile access is key because the research shows that with on-demand training, um, utilization doubles with mobile access. The other thing you get with uh, on-demand training that you don't get with classroom training is you get a way to assess knowledge transfer. And um, assessments ensure that you know, people are getting what you're saying and they result in an audible record of who knows what. And that can be very useful in the event of an investigation or dispute because what someone's going to need in a deposition is proof that the employee was trained and specifically what they were trained in. The standards for this type of assessment and certification are two standards called SCORM. 1.2 is the most current in AICC, and these are essentially digital files that result from the completion of a course that can then be transitioned over to a talent management software package and stored against an employee's card. Um, at some of our clients, what they do is they make access to social networks on an employee's workstation triggered by their certification. So they complete the certification, they get access to Facebook and Twitter on the company uh, computer. Um, I can give you some details on the economics of virtual training. It takes about 20 to 40 hours to develop one hour of virtual instructor-led training, which is like this, right? This is a webinar. And it takes about 30 to 50 hours to develop one hour of on-demand training, which would be something that people could access, you know, self-paced. Um, these numbers don't include live action video production. And the standard for a lot of uh, online training, particularly in the compliance sector that's out there now, is basically a PowerPoint with voiceover, which is pretty difficult to sustain someone's attention with and even more difficult to generate real knowledge transfer. Um, if you decide that you're going to generate your own online compliance training courseware, um, you should keep in mind that in this topic, the social media compliance, it's advancing so quickly that you're going to need to allocate resources for frequent updates. And I would allocate those resources for quarterly updates to keep your content fresh. So just to close up on my uh, portion of the webinar, which is about trust, um, and I've written dozens of social media policies for all types of organizations. I want to point out, you know, a lot of organizations will use language like, you know, common sense or good judgment in their policy as a way of trying to manage risk. And I think that approach is pretty meaningless. I actually think it's kind of obnoxious because it assumes everyone has the same understanding of what they consider to be acceptable on social media. And the truth is, everybody has a very different idea of what they consider to be appropriate, right? People are willing to share different things. So using this, these types of terms in a policy lacks clarity, it lacks specificity, and that's what leads to misunderstandings, and those lead to disputes and litigation, and that's disruptive to your business and your social marketing efforts. You, and, and I see this all the time, you know, policies that say use your common sense, but it's really just a rhetorical catch-all phrase for, you know, exercising good judgment, and if you don't actually show people what that is, and if you're not specific around that, I think that's where you get in trouble. And I also think, you know, most of us would agree that good judgment with respect to how we use social media in the workplace is really a work in progress, uh, much more so than a universally agreed upon theme. 
So if you want to enable trusted social media ambassadors, tell them specifically what's expected, train them to comply with those standards, and certify that they've been trained. Memorialize what you expect from them in a policy and explain your policy via social media compliance training. And now, um, Chris, I think you're going to tell us a little bit about how you verify compliance. Exactly. Thank you very much, Eric. That was great. And if anybody has any questions, please feel free to use the Q&A uh, or the chat function in the, uh, in the webinar to go ahead and forward those questions. And we'll take all the questions at the end. Um, my section on today's talk is, is talking about how do you verify compliance. And so there are a number of ways that you need to, you need to look at that. And, um, and, you know, Eric talked about how do we train people, how do we get them to understand what's going on with social and what they can and cannot do. And the other side of it is, is using some technologies and some policies, procedures together to be able to govern and, and impose and verify those kinds of requirements on your employees. Governance, of course, is the, is the very beginning of the cornerstone. You need to have a system like the Sprinkler platform that allows you to granularly control governance. Now, Sprinkler allows you to control governance in a number of different ways. We, we have the ability to create groups, and those groups can be either of accounts, such as Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn accounts, or they can be groups of users. Um, or combinations thereof. So what you can do is you can say this business unit has a group of accounts, which is a Facebook, a Twitter, a LinkedIn, and perhaps a YouTube account that they manage for that organization. So we group all those accounts together, and then we can say all the people in the sales department of that organization who are authorized to use social media are in another group. And then we can say the group of sales in this business unit has access to the group of accounts that are in that. So that allows you to create lots of uh, very granular control over who has access to which accounts and which sections of social media. The other side of governance is being able to manage who has access to features and functions within the system. So a simple way to illustrate that would be Sprinkler offers um, a social media um, uh, product management access system which allows you to manage your audio, your videos, your images, and other assets, and control those. And those can be governed just as well. And so you can say, here's an image which is available to um, all of our users who are managing accounts in this organization or this division of the company. And, and that image, that advertising image, or that asset, whatever it is, is only going, to be off, only going to be authorized to be used by those members of the groups that you designated before. So that gives you a very good control over how things are accessed. The next, the next thing is talking about an approval system. And for everybody in the, uh, in the regulated industries, approval is very, very important, of course. What Sprinkler does is allow you to automate the approvals and, give, uh, and create very, uh, very flexible approval schemes that can follow exactly what your organization is doing. So if I'm, uh, if I'm a user on the platform and I have access to, uh, or I'm, I'm a member of a group, then that group can be given a specific uh, automatic approval routing that pertains only to that group. So it might, it might automatically route all new messages into the management team, and then from management they might go to compliance, and then from compliance they might go to legal, and then finally, from legal, they might go into the community management team for, for distribution out to the social networks. And that can be intelligent. On top of that, you can get very, um, you can get very sophisticated with talking about exactly how different messages are routed in different ways. So that if I'm a younger user or, or less experienced or perhaps I'm not fully trained in social media yet, then I can be given more restrictive access and, and intelligent routing so that more people are going to have a, a, a look um, at my messaging and outgoing systems and things like that. Next we talk about automation. Automation is vitally important. Um, in today's social media environments for large organizations, being able to handle the thousands and tens of thousands of inbound messages. We were talking with a client um, just last week who, who experiences 30,000 inbound messages a year when they hold major events. I mean, I'm sorry, 30,000 inbound messages a minute when they hold a major event. 
there's no way that, that any organization, regardless of size, is going to be able to effectively manage those. Um, so what you need to do is staff up, get your people trained up, of course, and then use automation to identify what's coming in. Use keywords. Look for people that are looking for specific activities that are trying to connect with you about you know, things around that event. And then also use automation to identify the influencers and the advocates and other people that you may have uh, previously tagged or identified before an event or before a, a great deal of activity. So that you can then wrap those team, you know, wrap those people with teams that are designated to handle that. So the concept here is that when I've got a huge flood of incoming messages, I can take people that I've pre-designated as advocates or friends or or members of um, members of some sort of a promotional organization or club that I've got going, you know, for frequent flyers or things like that, and I can put those people into a queue that's ham that's that's then directed to organizations or groups of people within my organization who are prepared to handle that particular eventuality and, that, and, that, and those kinds of communications. So this is going to automate everything so that you don't have to depend on your frontline social media um, community managers in order to route messages to the appropriate teams. So routing and scanning for keywords on both the uh, inbound and the outbound side. On the outbound side, scanning for keywords is um, a very tremendous asset for reducing risk. In that case, what you're going to do is look for words that your organization doesn't want to put out there. That can be, uh, to begin with, it can be the seven dirty, dirty words you should never say in television. But you can also put words in there like profit or loss or um, other things that might relate to exactly what your business is. And using, uh, using outbound scanning and automation, you can, even, even if a message has already gone through an approval stream, you can still catch that message and say, I want one last group of people to take a look at that message before it goes out if it contains one of these words. Next, we want to talk about kill switches. Um, things happen in the world that cause us to rethink how we're going to be putting out social media messaging. Following the uh, Boston Marathon bombing, a lot of companies had the unfortunate um, uh, instance where they had pre-programmed marketing messages and those messages were getting ready to go out. And they went ahead and, and uh, those messages were sent because nobody was looking at it. So having a technology that allows you to put in a kill switch so that you can go in and say stop all pre-programmed messaging so that we can go in and take a look at the messages that are going out and decide whether or not we want those to go out at this particular time. It doesn't really matter what the contingency is or what the, uh, what the circumstances around it. Having the ability to say, let's just, take a, let's just take a pause, stop everything that's going out, and let's re reassess whether or not that's the appropriate thing for us to be talking to our audience about right now is the best way to approach that. The next thing, and, and this is one of the biggest challenges for those in regulated industries, is classically the approval process runs extremely slowly. And the graphic that we've got showing up it may not be familiar to many, uh, to many people. This is, a, this is a punch clock or a time clock that people used to use when they walked into work. They would take the card with their name on it and slip it into the clock and, and it would stamp the time that they arrived and then they put it on the other side of the clock. And at the end of the day, they'd pick up their card and, tamp and stamp it with the time that they left and then put it on the other side of the clock. So this is a nice antique little time clock. Actually, I believe it's an assault line, um, which some of us may feel like we're working in some days. But the concept here is that if I've got an approval process, the, in social media today, 15 minutes in responding to a tweet on Twitter is a very long time. Three or four hours is, is really, really pushing it. Most approval processes in regulated industries, three or four hours is light speed. It's moving at an, at an enormous pace that you're not used to. So it's going to take time to get the organization slimmed down, streamlined, and, and designed to, to move at the speed of social media today. Having a system that's going to allow you to monitor that and, and measure your progress and see if you can arrange your, your service level agreements with your, you know, with your different teams that have to be involved in the approval, and then be able to measure that and report back to those teams and say, you're meeting your SLA or you're missing it. You know, maybe, you know, maybe if you set up a two or three hour SLA, 
you know, maybe maybe uh, 70 or 80 percent of the time they're hitting it and they understand that they're getting close to the mark and they need to put a little bit of work into it. That allows you to better manage things, set expectations around your organization, and, and, and enable you to communicate to your social media audience and, and set expectations there as well. Now, the ability to monitor, moderate, and enforce controls at scale is, is the biggest and most important piece of, of minimizing the risk. So that is a combination of most of the things that we talked about. The, the ability to govern, understand which groups of people are going to have access to which features and functions within a social media management system, and be able to monitor and moderate what's going on. So being able to have automated rules that allow you to then bring on hundreds of, of people within your organization and get them involved in social media to carry the brand's message, but understand that you've got the ability to moderate and control that using automation to scan all of your outgoing messages and understand what's going on, using automation to scan your uh, social media assets because there are going to be times when people are going to be posting directly on Facebook. So having an automation system that can grab those messages that are posted directly on Facebook, run them against the set of rules, such as the set of keywords that you never want mentioned anywhere online and things like that, and, and alert somebody on the team in case something like that happens. There are legitimate times when people need to post directly on Facebook because there are certain functionalities and capabilities in Facebook that are not supported through the API, so you can't use those functions with any kind of a system. So definitely do need to have the capability, but if your Facebook account is hacked and somebody guesses a password or, or finds access somehow and starts posting things that are not approved and authorized by your organization, having the ability to enforce that at scale, be notified of that right away and pull those messages down automatically is essential to defending your brand. And then, you know, to monitor and re remediate those risks. So, Having that ability to understand that, that something's going on on Facebook that you didn't authorize or Twitter or any other network and being able to notify everybody who's, uh, who needs to know about it and then be able to uh, respond to that in a, in a quick way is very important. Understanding those risks is what you need to do and, and understand which risks you can't necessarily remediate, you can't remove those. Those, the risks that you can't that you can't remove are what are the people going to say in response to whatever you post out there. Lots of examples of, of organizations that have started social media um, pushes and then had those things just go south on them because you know the audience took it in a different direction. And that's one of the risks that you're just going to have to face and understand and, and put together a plan on how to how to handle that when that happens. And then finally, you want to make sure that you've got workflow that automates your processes like review and compliance and all. Lots of people out there are trying to do compliance using uh, email and spreadsheets. You know, here are the next 200 tweets that we're going to send next month. And that's wonderful as long as you can plan that out a month in advance. But maybe there are things going on immediately that you need to, that you need to be able to discuss and then create a position on and then respond to your audience right away. If that's happening, you need to do that quickly. So having the ability to embed that workflow and automate those processes so that you can get compliance and get reviews going on and move those things ahead in a timely manner so that you can react to what's going on in social media makes a big difference. And then finally, of course, you need to archive and store your records to be able to uh, demonstrate to regulation authorities as well as your auditors, both internally and externally, everything that you've done. And having the ability to archive everything that you've done, including the interior conversations or internal conversations that you've had about social messaging. So if you put a message out in social media and some of your customers respond to that in a way that you didn't anticipate, being able to discuss how to, how to handle that internally and do that in a system that's going to store all those discussions and keep that all in a place that you can find and produce when you're asked to by regulators or uh, auditors or anything is vitally important. And finally, you need to have security and protection at an enterprise level. And that means that you need to have, you know, top grade systems that are installed on systems of record that are well recognized. You need to have approvals from organizations like um, SOC, SOC1, SOC2 kinds of approvals. 
and have all that and have a and have a thoroughly documented security policy from the vendor that's supplying your platform and make sure that that ties in with your internal policies and procedures as well. And then lastly, having social media um, structure around a large uh, a large group of, of pieces of the social media that you're doing, but that doesn't cover all of it, is a, is a serious problem. So you need to make sure that you can handle all the aspects of all the social media that you're doing. So you need to be able to, on LinkedIn, cover companies as well as groups. On Facebook, you need to be able to cover pages and profiles and all sorts of different aspects of all these different uh, social networks, including the advertising. So if you can tie all that together in a single system, a system that's going to archive all the information for you and make it available for you whenever you need it, that's the way to make, make sure that you're limiting the challenges and ensuring compliance in social media. And then, of course, a uniform system across the entire organization ensures that it makes it very simple for you to understand that and expand your social footprint within the organization. Because in reality, probably everybody on this phone is looking for ways to be able to get their organization to be more social. So you don't want to just have little pockets of social here and there. You want to expand that. So it goes well beyond just marketing. You want to go into per, um, PR, you know, public relations. You want to go into IR for investor relations. You want to go into HR for hiring and recruitment and also for monitoring employee activities understanding what's going on there, and then customer service. And customer service is probably the greatest expansion area for social media today, but a lot of people are thinking about social media as being primarily a marketing function or primarily marketing and, and customer service. And we've got lots of organizations that are doing PR and IR and HR as well very, very successfully. So now we're going to go into Q&A. So what kind of customer or what kind of questions do we have out there today? If you, uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to jump right into uh, the chat and we'll go on there. You can also uh, tweet us at, uh, using the hashtag social at scale, that's S-O-C-I-A-L-A-T-S-C-A-L-E. So um, Eric, we've got one question, which is what is, uh, what is the approximate cost of social media compliance training? Social media compliance training is sold by the license um, because the assessment and the scorecard is tied to a specific individual. So um, a license is a class, and uh, depending on the number of classes and the number of employees that were mandatory, that would determine the number of license. The retail price for a single license is $99 a class. But in volume, that price goes down to around five dollars a class. So, and there are breakpoints throughout that based on the number of licenses. Excellent. Very good. Um, now, another comment that we, or another question we got was, uh, can we prevent posting directly on Facebook? I talked about that a little bit in that um, there are there are features and functions that most of the social networks don't supply in their APIs to any kind of a social management system. So you're going to need to definitely post directly on Facebook for some features if you want to use those things. Examples are on Facebook are questions and, and things like that. Um, and you can certainly talk to your, uh, your Sprinkler contact about uh, any specifics, or you can email us at info at sprinkler.com for more details on what, the, what those limitations might be. You'll definitely need to post directly on some of your social networks. Um, what you can do with uh, any kind of a social media uh, management system is have the ability to import messages that were not directly posted and then run those against rules and things like that. Um, Eric, can, can courses be, um, be, mount, be hosted in, in a learning management system in the organization's uh, infrastructure inside their secure enterprise infrastructure? Yeah, they can. The, um, all of our courses are authored in standard uh, software courseware authoring packages and can be hosted in pretty much any LMS we have been able to. Uh, we haven't run up against an LMS that our courses couldn't be hosted in yet. And some clients do opt to take the uh, courses and, and put them in their own LMSs uh, because in some cases they have a real commitment to those systems. Excellent. Great. Now we've got one last question here, which is um, 
how do you include, the, include the, the kinds of notices that Eric talked about in Twitter posts because you're limited to 140 characters? And that's a great question. You know, Eric talked about how um, lots of regulations require you to include different kinds of notices in, in every social media post. Um, there, are, um, there are capabilities such as, uh, there's a website called Tweet Longer. Um, and Sprinkler's platform has the capability built into it as well. And that allows you to create very long messages, much more than 140 characters. And what it does is it truncates the message that you, that you create and uh, includes a URL in it. So you can write a message that would fit within a standard Twitter format and have a URL to take you to a complete, you know, to a web page that would have your Twitter account's background on that page and it has the full text of whatever you want to. And you can go up to five or 10,000 characters that way. So you can include all the requirements, you know, all the re regulatory required notices and all that. I think that's it. For think compliance sure. with the uh, FTC.com disclosure guidelines, all you have to do if you're an employee tweeting on behalf of your employer from a personal profile um, is have hashtag AD um, for ad advertisement in the body of the tweet, and the FTC has said that that would satisfy the, the, uh, the compliance. Great, great point. Thank you very much, Eric. Um, so we're just, about, uh, we're just about out of time. We're just about 45 minutes. Eric, do you have any closing comments? Uh, no, I just want to thank all the folks at Sprinkler for inviting me to participate. Um, if you haven't already, you might want to download the social media compliance uh, white paper that um, uh, Comply Socially and Sprinkler released together. Where can they get that, Chris? Um, that's a great question. It's going to be on our website. And what we'll do is we'll put that into the Q&A um, here on the, on the uh, webinar. You caught me off guard with that one, Eric. Good question. <laughs> great. And I, I would also say, say, say if, anybody, if anybody would like um, you know, access to one of the courses, um, we're happy to provide that. Great. Excellent. And um, thank you, everyone, for attending. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to uh, Sprinkler Info at Sprinkler.com. And Eric can be reached at Eric at ComplySocial.com. And for Chris Keep at Sprinkler and Eric at Comply Social, we want to say thank you all very much for attending and have a wonderful day.